Chapter 2. Opening Forbidden Doors. If Dixie was dumb enough to fall into the portal in that bathroom, then maybe there should be some goofy oval-shaped footprints lurking around here somewhere. If these portals lead to the same place, thought Chili. She kept her eyes peeled for any sign of fresh tracks on the snow, especially anything that would resemble any trace of her best friend. I really wish that bastard had left a note, or a warning not to be as stupid as him, she groaned. As she fought these thoughts, she continued climbing, and soon she found herself feeling surprisingly calm. That is, until she looked at the horizon behind her and saw a small flock of birds flapping their wings. They were headed towards the mountain. As she stared closer, she realized the birds must have been gigantic, seeing how they must still be a great deal away. And as they approached and changed direction to avoid crashing into the mountain, she could see them silhouetted against the sky. Chili convulsed with alarm. These things did not look like birds at all. If tree trunks could fly and lie horizontally as they flapped their branches like wings, this is what she was seeing. But trees aren't supposed to fly, right? Right? She cried to no one in particular. Chili Sue tried to let her memory trace into any knowledge that could justify the typical flight dynamics of inanimate plant life. But this whole scene was more than she could handle. Okay, master yourself. Master yourself, she kept screaming to herself. This place is actually a paradise. Look around. But the key is right there. Master yourself. Once she calmed down enough, she took five more deep breaths and looked around. Great advice, Chili, she complimented herself as she continued to study the landscape. Scanning for tracks, she considered maybe she had missed Dixie's footprints. Whatever, she grunted. Stop depleting your energy with hysterics. The plateau was getting closer. She picked up the pace, even though her cardio wasn't that good. If Dixie was around, then perhaps from that elevation she could see, maybe, his giant head bobbing around in the valley somewhere. Chili Sue climbed up higher and higher. The worst thing about this place was that she could never actually see the sun. There was just a gradient of brighter golden light coming from what she guessed had to have been the direction of the west. Finally, she made it. The view was very good up here. As she looked around, she couldn't see anything else that resembled the familiar valleys of Ziana. The cloudy haze encircling the distant horizon had started to break, but this revelation only made her pale. She could see multiple moons hovering on the horizon that were completely unnatural. And the piles of dirt in the clouds were not an illusion due to the haze. They literally were just piles of stuff resting on top of them. There were also strange triangle-shaped objects floating in the sky. They looked like moons at first. They were about the same size of them at least. And they were the same white hazy color of them. But they were shaped like upside-down pyramids. Chili Sue stumbled backwards and fell in her butt in alarm. If this was Mount Muhideu, this certainly wasn't Earth. Must get up higher, was all she could think. There must be a better view from there. If that's southeast, then behind this mountain must be northwest. Damn it. The plateau was like a step at the bottom of another slope. And the top of the slope was what she guessed was yet another plateau... But she had to reach the summit. Chilly climbed up another 200 yards, looking around for a friend. Still nothing. Now the light in the sky was starting to dim fast. The entire dome of sky above her went from a beautiful golden to a surreal sight. Instead of a nice dark sky with white stars scattered all over, she was treated to a bizarre looking dark evergreen sky with blue stars scattered all over the heavens. By this time, she didn't care anymore. This was all too weird, but she was getting used to it. She convinced herself multiple times that she wasn't dreaming after punching her legs hard and giving herself a few charley horses in the process. But after realizing she needed to conserve energy, she just decided to stop beating herself up and accepting the reality of the circumstances. Luckily, one thing that took sooner to get comfortable with were these strange plants she kept stumbling upon. Good for her. They seemed to be edible. They were all over the trail in the upper regions. Such peculiar fruit, if fruit it was. They were wrapped in a red and white striped container with roots that grew like a weed. They were filled with what looked like edible red-colored berries inside. 
They look like candy in a popcorn bag. Now, this truly is peculiar, Chili thought. Common sense told her not to pick up strange food along the ground. At first, she avoided any thought in her mind about eating it and remembered her power bars in her bag. But the plants were too tempting to ignore, despite the fact that, with their bright colors, they would likely have been poisonous or, at best, hallucinogenic. Huh. Maybe I already swallowed one of these accidentally, she thought. After a while, as she kept feeling hungrier, Chili Sue finally relented, and she grabbed one of these inexplicably odd-looking cartons, and sniffing its contents, she couldn't resist this thing. To hell with her conservative power bars. The smell coming out of the plant was invigorating. It smelled like some sort of raspberry. And as she reached over to pick another one up, the aroma alone resurrected her limbs as if she had just drunk a half a bottle of fire cider. Forget it, she gambled. Life is too short anyways. As she studied the berries, she was surprised, for many of them were shaped like red gummy candies that kids would eat. But the berries resembled the shape of those giant eastern island heads, the same ones she had seen in travel magazines. She finally had to confess to herself how tasty they looked. It was going to drive her nuts not to try one. She closed her eyes and played one potato, two potato to pick her dinner between the popcorn plant and her power bars. The popcorn won. Carelessly, Chili threw one of the gummy berries in her mouth and swallowed it before she could change her mind. At the very stroke of her tongue, it did taste delicious. One munch later, and Chili noted how strangely energized she felt. Her thinking got clear and her strength levels appeared. Wow. They appeared to increase so much without hardly having to induce any effort to move. Soon she found herself running up the slope like a gazelle. Damn lucky, maybe, she said to herself. It was as if fate had placed this energy source here for her convenience. Once she reached the second plateau, Chili Sue didn't even turn around to get a look at the view. She just kept marveling at her feet as they sped across the flat surface. She was so excited by this newfound ability that she found herself picking up her speed even more. Finally, she looked to her left. From this vantage point, she could see what she guessed was the southern skyline left of the plateau. The haze had completely disintegrated, and far away in that direction, Chile could see it, a desert plain that made her wonder if those were the speed traps of Peepity's Nice. That looked comforting. Then, looking up at the sky above to her left, where the thick clouds had once stood, she could see another one of those upside-down triangle pyramids floating up there. It was titanic. She slowed down and stared at it in wonder. It almost looked like a spaceship. There were clearly linear designs on it that were too complex to be a natural astral body, and it had extensions protruding from its underside like some sort of antenna. All right, she said to no one. None of this makes sense. Not this landscape, or how she got here, or her newfound strength. Straight ahead, along the plateau, was a giant set of oxidized-looking bronze double doors. This first sight of anything resembling civilization gave her a much-needed sense of comfort. They couldn't have been more than a half a mile away. They were carved into the snowy mountainside and were nested underneath a large snow-carven alligator head. An entrance there, leading into the mountain. Wow. And beyond, it was plain that climbing the rest of the slope would have been impossible without climbing gear. The incline was way too steep. If this had been a legitimate ski patrol trail on Mount Mojadeo at one time, it would have had to have been a black diamond race to the second power, thought Chili. As she approached the doors, Chili Sue was surprised to find herself whistling one of Strength from Orange's more popular hit tunes. It was stuck in her head, and she wished it wasn't, even if she didn't know I've Been Working on the Railroad was an original song at all. She cursed herself as she continued to run. She couldn't stand how songs got stuck in her head so much, and she didn't like their music one bit. It just happened to be a catchy tune. I wonder if those poor bastards are out here wandering around somewhere, too, Chili thought as she surveyed the landscapes. Dorian Bramlett definitely wrote some of the most obnoxious music ever to grace a human race, but I still wouldn't wish getting stranded out here in this Bermuda Triangle upon anyone. 
Of course, that was assuming Chile really was on Mount Muhadeu near Ziana, and so was Dorian. No, really, where the hell am I? She thought. Chile reached the doors. She tried a few knocks at the entrance, followed by a pause. And once concluding that no one existed in this part of the world anyway, she gave the doors a push. They weren't locked, but it took a few correctly landed shoves by the edge of the door handles to open them. The hinges may have been rusted, and it looked like no one had used this entrance in ages. Inside, she found herself on a cobblestone walkway with an intimidating precipice dropping into a black abyss on either side. There were no light fixtures, lamps, or torches. Yet the whole walkway was enclosed by a large hollow chamber radiating a dark green glow from the rock wall. At the end of the walkway was a large black chasm leading to a surrounding abyss. More and more darkness everywhere. The darkness here was thicker than before and it made her uneasy. It took her a few moments to adjust to the dimmer surroundings. But across the chasm lay another giant pillar, slightly taller in height to the platform she was standing on. Laying on top of the pillar was a large blue quartz statue like the ones outside. It resembled a wise-looking guru sitting cross-legged and wearing a mask that concealed the face with curling hair. Although the thing looked inanimate, it felt alive in a way that Chili Sue could not begin to describe. So she half waited for it to speak to her. But after five minutes of staring at each other, Chili Sue decided to walk away. As she approached the exit, she could feel a presence behind her. It felt intense, as if the statue had somehow snuck up inches from behind her in all its towering dread. But when Chili turned around, there was no one there, only the statue looking at her as before. Plucking up her courage, she spoke up and asked it where she was but still no response. Oh, man, she yelled in a panic. And then the statue spoke, and in her own language. And this only made her yelp out loud, even a bigger scream. Do you fear confrontation? Or are you wise enough to refuse? Confrontation is part of life. The statue asked. You do realize confrontation part of life. The statue went on again, or at least it felt like it was asking her a question. It perceived more like an audible voice in her head that she knew was not her own thoughts. Maybe her mind was playing tricks on her. Could you at least live peace with that? It continued. Although some would tell you, it would be wise to avoid adversity altogether. It doesn't change the reality that Things happen to solve you. Are you prepared for them? What do you mean? Asked Chili out loud as if addressing the statue voice. But the statue didn't directly respond. Better to live simultaneously in a state of readiness, along with ease. Even, Even if, if you do not, not see trouble. trouble. It said discreetly. Too bad. Too, bad. too many, many learn that, learn that lesson, lesson when it's, when it's too, too alert. alert. It was comforting that at least a statue thing was giving her some sort of recognition that she was there. And never mind that all of this went against reality. Chili Sue figured if she could keep the dialogue going, this thing might ultimately give her some aid in getting back to King Cankerville. Do you have any idea how I could get back to where I'm from? She asked with complete sincerity in her voice. What is this place? Place, place where you will, will see, see what is, what is the home. home. The oracle thing responded. Nature is fierce and calm at the same time. It's intense in some ways, just like a person's emotions. Anger it enough, and it will recover. you. How so? she asked. But the statue remained evasive with another indirect response. A person who does not, who not necessarily, necessarily reflect, reflect nature, nature is not, is not in the right ideal state. state. They will, they be, will out be out of alignment, alignment with the higher, higher levels, levels of real, real world. World. Neither will that person be able to fathom solutions when their world starts to tear around them. 
years, had you all had been brave enough to realize it, you would have been able to find solutions to this and prevented this thing from happening. You would realize nature is not meant to be something and so verbal in the ways you reflect it becomes. I don't know what the hell that means, she insisted. Panic was setting in. What are you? She cried, but the voice of the statue did not reply. Instead, it appeared content to mock her with vague clues about this whole dilemma she was in. It spoke of time cycles, Mayans, and some other banter. If a person is too sensitive and brutal, the statue said while it continued ignoring her question, that person will never compliment the essence of the natural world. They will never comprehend reality as it's supposed to be. They will never gain Balrama. If you could only conceive these ideas in your heads, you could finally be like the rest of us. You can reach beyond that threshold where the universe is telling you how to be impervious to all sorts of pain. It all sounded so deep. But to Chile, this was not the time for debating metaphysical mysteries with inanimate objects. Although somewhere in her mind, Chile Sue swore she had heard a similar idea come to her in a dream. Then the voice resonating in her head, or from the statue, she couldn't tell, began to interrogate her. What was she doing here? If she was something called a Hamelavoit? A Helmavoit? That's what it was, a Helmavoit. Or if she was someone carrying a Karatlas? A word, actually, that she recalled had been written somewhere in esoteric myths. And if she knew about the Yuga cycles of time. The resonating voice then seemed very condescending as if it sensed she wasn't supposed to be here at all, as if this experience was meant solely for one of these Helmavoids. No, I do not have a Karatlas on me, she answered back. But she didn't even know what that meant. So frustrating. The statue wouldn't answer any of her questions. What this place was, how she could get back, and most importantly, what these portals were all about. While the statue continued to talk, Chili could feel herself getting increasingly desperate. But after half listening to it, spurred out one useless diatribe after another, something strange started welling inside of her. She could feel her emotional intelligence getting fierce. Dixie liked to describe it as a strange superpower that Chili couldn't fully control. And she never really saw it as a skill that could be utilized to its full potential, seeing how she couldn't summon it all the time. Hence, her inability to master her academic laziness and her failing grades at school. Yet sometimes, when struggles amplified into what felt like life or death circumstances like this, something inside her wits could magically kick into overdrive. So as the statue kept spewing more nonsense to her, Chili Sue started formulating a plan. While it toyed with her, she was able to gather small clues from it about what was going on what this place really was, and even an explanation of the portals. As Chili put two and two together, the first thing that came out of her mouth was the sheer injustice of her and seemingly virtually everyone else's predicament. How the hell is this our fault? She stammered back. Sounds like most of us were duped. Blame those other ones pulling the strings then, those, those... Deep down. Sounds like you still had a choice. The statue responded rather callously and indifferently. It didn't seem to be much of a sympathizer to what was happening. But to her surprise, amidst the babble, it posed possible solutions as to what could be done to stop these things called time cycles. Apparently, the portals that were threatening everyone were a product of some defense mechanism that the physical Earth was instigating on its inhabitants. Like antibodies... The portals were starting to appear because somehow it said the human race was becoming too toxic with its respect to nature. Actually, not even nature, but some sort of harmonic resonating something from an energy field found outside of the universe called Kerfta, which the statue thing would not elaborate on. As the statue thing continued, 
Chili had an idea. She reached into her backpack and searched for a pen and any scrap paper she could find. Despite the dim lighting, she madly started to record everything the statue was saying, no matter how random. She sensed there may be a chance these rants could tie with the clues in her book. Evidently, something called the Proscluis had risen from its sleep and become self-aware and how something about multi-earths needed to fight back against humanity and wipe it out like a harmful virus. Cryptic stuff indeed, but something else the statue told her about Mayan calendars able to read such signs. And then there was something else about quote-unquote too much bickering and not enough compassion, not even in the multi-earths. Multi-earths? Chili wondered. Self-destruction is bound to happen to those without true enlightenment, said the voice of the statue. None, None of this, this would, would should even surprise you. Find, find the exits. exits. Exits? Chili cried. Portals across phantom oceans, said the voice almost mischievously. But you will never get there. You are not a humble boy. You do not know the world. We will not do anything to you. Nature decides your truth on its own. Chili Sue kept pressing it to explain itself. What it was, how it claimed to know these things. How it could speak her own language. But the statue did not respond. In fact, the resonance that she could feel radiating from it had disappeared. It was like some soul that gave it a voice had left it. Finally, Chili gave up. Slowly, she walked out of the chamber in a solemn mood and with her head bowed. She didn't know if anyone was secretly watching her this whole time, but she refused to show despair. She opened the doors and was strangely blinded by the dark green sky radiating over the ski slope outside, even if it looked to be nighttime. Compared to the stuffiness of the chamber, the slightly fresher air hit her like a slap of sweet ointment that resurrected her spirits. But even now, this place still made her feel like she was indoors. Walking up to another nearby rock, Chili Sue sat down and opened up the comforting pages of esoteric myths and esoteric places once again. She could barely read the text in it. The moons were glowing now, but they were too far away. The strange triangular-shaped spaceships in the sky now appeared like black shadows floating up there. The silhouettes of a few more of those strange tree-shaped objects could be seen flying overhead. As Chili Sue skimmed through esoteric myths, she found some similar connections there to the note she took and had to smile. She had no idea what half of these things meant, but she felt like she had outwitted a thing. Or at least she hoped so with all her heart. For two hours, Chili Sue sat on the large rock near the double doors. Where the hell was she? She scanned the entire landscape. The clouds were gathering along the horizon again and blocking the far-off countryside. But aside from the blue statues everywhere, this had to be Mount Mujadeo. Chili closed her eyes and relaxed on the rock. She refused to let her adrenaline muddle her wits. Was she dead? If she was, this didn't seem so bad. Nothing had physically attacked her, and she had a seemingly unlimited supply of plants with performance-enhancing abilities growing all around her. Maybe the portal had brought her into an alternate universe. If so, that didn't seem so bad either. Chili had to remind herself that in a twisted way, this is what she had always wanted. High adventure and an escape from the mundane existence she knew. How do I get out and back to my own reality? Chili Sue cried out loud, rather annoyed. She almost imagined that the spirit of the statue was still watching her. It must find me curious, she thought. It's only a matter of time before it will get bored. It wants to talk. Against any logical reasoning... Chili's own rationale started to give her confidence. No sense staying around here, she thought to herself. Might as well continue having to look around. Chili walked back to the edge of the ski slope, 
below the plateau she was standing on. She scooped up another handful of the strange popcorn plants and threw them in her bag. Recklessly, she shoved a huge handful of the gummy-shaped berries in her mouth, and immediately an overwhelming surge of energy welled up in her again. At first, she wondered what this might do to her circadian rhythms, and if she might become addicted to these things. But soon, she let herself stop worrying. This will end either really good or really bad, she thought. She started running through the woods, now encircling the southern circumference of the mountain. She followed no clear path nor saw any sign of anyone or any path. But shaking all semblance of anxiety off her shoulders, she felt incredibly alive. Soon she stumbled onto another ski slope that appeared right between the trees, crushing a couple twigs along the way and stubbing more than a few times her toes. She crossed two more forests and two more snowy greenways in this fashion. Chili Sue finally got a better view of the lands along the southern side of the mountain. It was a beautiful countryside over there, but she could still see no signs of light pollution or any human settlements. The haze in the horizon had picked up again. Directly to her right, a cloud of thick swirling fog covered the entire side of the mountain over there. Again and thus hiding the mysterious area where Inakaland should technically be existing on the map. Go figure. If this was possibly Mount Muhideu, then Inakaland surely existed in that direction. But if it was not Inakaland, then who knew what lay beyond the fog? She didn't like the fog's unique motion. It didn't drift by horizontally across the landscape, so much as swirl in a continuous circular fashion that she had never seen before in a cloud. The fog looked like funnel clouds from some sort of sideways tornadoes that she was staring at from above. Chili Sue stared at the countryside below again, desperately looking one last time for any sign of intelligent life. Once again, she forced herself to fight off the feelings of intense panic welling inside. But soon, she let pure recklessness kick in instead. She ran and plunged into the cloud of swirling fog. If Inakaland is so close, I can at least claim I tried to reach this stupid place, she thought, as she slammed into a few trees in the dark fog. Chili couldn't see anything in front of her, but she was surprised to find this side of the mountain amazingly devoid of trees. With my luck, I'm probably going to run off a cliff or something, she mused. She was right. It was the last thought she could remember before everything changed. She found herself in a sensation of freefall. It felt like she was falling through a cloud, but curiously not at the standard rate of 9.8 meters per second squared that the pull of Earth's gravity should allow. Strangely enough, no more feelings of fighting irresponsible fear ensued. There was freedom. Finally. Another one of Strength from Orange's stupid hits started playing in her head with no warning while she plunged. Why now? She asked herself out loud. It might have been for the better. The distraction was keeping her calm. But the fact remained that 99 bottles of beer on the wall was not the kind of song she wanted stuck in her head at a moment like this. I heard it was a cover song, she thought, while plunging gently into nothingness. Nobody should be able to sell platinum based on cover songs. It just isn't fair. She could feel herself slowly losing her sanity. But as she continued to plummet, she closed her eyes and relaxed succumbing to the rapture of nothingness.